Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'm Josh Schimmels, publisher and CEO of the Los Angeles Business Journal. And I'm excited to be here for our first event of 2023, which is an economic trends discussion. Today, we have regional experts with us to share their insights on the biggest headlines and where they see the market heading over the next 12 months. We've got two great panels this afternoon, each which is going to be about 25 to 30 minutes long. So we've got a lot of great content that we're going to try to put in a small period of time to be as efficient with everyone's time as possible. We're going to cover topics today, such as the current employee-employer relationship, increased rates and inflation, business moving out of state, and then alternatively, reasons to stay and to grow here in Los Angeles. Measure ULA, and overall, what to expect in commercial real estate throughout Los Angeles and the region over the next year. Uh, I'll say we've received a lot of great questions from our audience members that we always allow during the registration process. We've incorporated many of those into our panel discussion. So I want to thank each of you who did send those in uh, as you help contribute to our overall conversation. I also want to mention during the interactive discussions that we're having, we'll be conducting live audience poll questions. So when you see these questions pop up on your screen, we encourage you to respond, to share your experience with us, and then we'll publish the results on our event site next week. Before we begin, I'd like to take just a quick moment. I want to thank our sponsors, not just for their support of this program and for all the time and energy that they put in to this discussion today, but everything that they do in our community of business overall. So special thank you to Colliers, KPMG, and Wilmington Trust. Thank you all so much. Okay, we've got a lot of great information. Uh, we're going to jump right in with our first panel, which is going to be discussing trends to watch in 2023. Please welcome Kevin Connor, Managing Director, Connor Advisory Group. Larry Holt, Vice President, Economic and Workforce Development at Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation. Brian Ord, President, Wilmington Trust. And today's moderator, Elsa Burton, Los Angeles Regional Manager at Fifth Third Bank. Elsa, welcome. It's great to see you again. Thank you, Josh. Good to see you as well. Uh, so let's kick this off and let's start with a question for the group. Uh, we are not in the clear just yet. The pandemic loomed heavily over the past couple of years. How is the pandemic having a continued impact of the relationship between employees and their employers? Kevin, let's start with you. Sure. Thank you, Elsa. Can you hear me properly? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the, the, the overall... Economic and Workforce Development at Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation. Brian Ord, President, Wilmington Trust. And today's moderator, Elsa Burton, Los Angeles Regional Manager at Fifth Third Bank. Elsa, welcome. It's great to see you again. Thank you, Josh. Good to see you as well. Uh, so let's kick this off and let's start with a question for the group. While we are not in the clear just yet, the pandemic loomed heavily over the past couple of years. How is the pandemic having a continued impact of the relationship between employees and their employers? Kevin, let's start with you. Sure, thank you, Elsa. Can you hear me properly? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the, the, the overall uh, situation continues to be friction between employers and employees. Uh, being an employer myself, I, I know it firsthand with uh, with a small organization, uh, smaller organization, I should say less than 20 employees, but um, there's still COVID related issues that are still here that are uh, popping up and they uh, continue to be an issue. Uh, work from home, work from anywhere continues to be a challenge. Um, the, uh, the issue that we have is uh, continued trust in our employees that they're gonna do the right thing and provide us with uh, you know a reasonable, a reasonable amount of work every day for uh, for what they're being paid and all the responsibilities that they have. Um, number three, uh, the recent layoffs with, uh, especially with companies like Microsoft and FedEx, you know, they hit the headlines. Um, you know, we're, you know, we as a smaller firm, you know, we're affected by that because our, 
our clients are um, within our corporate restructuring practice are you know are affected with uh, with the amount of layoffs that are taking place. And I think that that even though they're the the top head top ten headlines, uh, it becomes a it becomes a serious issue for everybody. And I think that um, you know Nasdaq just announced that they had a very good month in the month of January. And my first reaction, you know, having been there with a client on Monday at Nasdaq in New York, um, it was a result of profits. The layoffs were uh, uh, the reason why the uh, companies are showing uh, increased profits and in, in, on their uh, on their income statements on a quarterly basis. So there's a there's a lot of issues out there. Um, at least from where I sit, you know, we're we're quite optimistic that uh, you know companies of any size, from the smallest organization to the largest. They have to go through a, a restructuring and a reorganization at some point in their in the life cycle, and I think we're going to see a lot more uh, restructuring. We're going to see a lot more layoffs with the you know the better headlines, but also those companies that make up main I call it Main Street as opposed to Wall Street, and um, it's going to be a you know a tremendous uh, tremendous issue for industries like the uh, uh, the electric vehicle industry that uh, you know is responsible for 276,000 jobs in in southern california and even though they're continuing to grow uh you know and they project to be 400,000 employees in the next 5 years in southern california um they, those jobs are not you know they they are uh quite driven by you know highly educated highly specialized trained employees that can deal with uh the electric car industry or electric vehicles and it becomes a it becomes a major issue for for the average person to uh to be able to compete in those environments so the people that we deal with in, in our restructuring practice are you know primarily consumer products companies that um the semi-skilled and non-skilled workers are uh you know tremendously at a disadvantage and displaced because of uh the specialty work and and companies squeezing as much profits out of uh out of their pro out of the process and that has a it has a direct impact on the relationship between employees and employers and it's something that i deal with you know every day in my business life and uh the employees are are the backbone to what we do and if we don't have them uh, we don't we don't have a business but uh some companies don't feel that way so that's that's my take on on that so far Right. Okay, great. Larry, what about you? What are your uh, thoughts? You know, I think I would just reiterate Kevin's comments, which is I was looking at some data points on, you know, what that return to work looks like in Los Angeles. And uh, like of the top 55 metro areas in the country, Los Angeles was like uh, fifth from the bottom, you know, um, fully uh, work trips have been reduced. Um, you know, by a factor of about 26% here in Los Angeles County. So that, that continues to ripple uh, throughout the economy and especially in the commercial real estate space. And then I think on a, a personal level, what Kevin was getting at that, that I, that resonated with me was, you know, how do you, you know, given work from home and a hybrid environment, how do you manage people now? And I think I have a team of 10 that I manage here. And so, you know, I think I've got to do a better job of listening and, and meeting people where they are. And, you know, when you're you're in a hybrid environment, you're, you're you know, you're, those people are uh, really struggling with family issues all the time. Um, and so how can I be more empathetic and supportive while still uh, delivering on the goals of the organization? So, uh, you know, I don't I don't think we're that, you know, I think this is an issue throughout the U.S., uh, but certainly still a major issue in Los Angeles. Thank you, Elsa. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian, Oops, Larry. And Brian, your thoughts? Yeah, I'll, uh, I think there's a few things that uh, I focus on culture, teamwork, and communication. I think those have been the biggest challenges. It's really hard to build a culture uh, if you don't have people here. Uh, so that certainly has been a big challenge. I think you have to really work at communicating what your your vision, your mission, and your intent is. Uh, we've restructured our meeting flow uh, to have more small doses of daily meetings as a way of enhancing that communication. Mm -hmm. And if you think about teams and how dysfunctional teams work or how high functioning teams work, uh, the art of it or the, the foundational piece of it is communication and the establishment of trust. And that 
can only be done in person. I think from my perspective, the, the folks that are suffering the most are the younger employees who are lacking those opportunities for the mentoring conversations that go on uh, on a daily basis. And so, um, I, you know, my feeling is it's a challenge, but you just got to have a plan and you got to work hard at it. I think employees crave that opportunity for the camaraderie. It's just we have as employers, we have to create those opportunities. Yep, I agree. Great comments. Um, Larry, you and your team are experts when it comes to our local economy. How does L.A. County rank nationally for job growth? This is going to be painful for me, but uh, the numbers aren't great, you know, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm someone that's working on, you know, really kind of guiding our future for our economy. But I think uh, it's important to really note where we are. And so, uh, again, referring to a data point here, like coming out of uh, the pandemic, uh, out of 190 metros, uh, L.A. ranked 141st. So uh, do you want to call that a C minus or a D plus? Uh, it's not a report card I would be happy to take home. So. Uh, certainly a lot of challenges remain and services are still uh, heavily impacted in Los Angeles, which, as you know, continues to have effects throughout uh, our tourist economy for Los Angeles, which is one of our big drivers of, um, of touch points with the rest of the world, affecting even our global trade capacity. So, uh, you know, uh, really, we're in that um, bottom 40th percentile. Uh, in terms of recovery and, and truthfully over the last 20 years dating back to 2000 uh, Los Angeles uh, metro area uh, was around 35th 36th of those top 50 U.S. metros again the biggest of the big communities in the U.S. which had us behind Baltimore um, so yeah. I think there are plenty of challenges out there uh, for all of us to reflect on uh, I'm going to share some hopeful thoughts later in the conversation, uh, but need to be candid about where we are in terms of job growth over the past 20 years and where we are coming out of the pandemic. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Kevin, will the Fed continue to increase rates? We saw that today. And what effect will it have on inflation, which is projected by some to be less than 3% by Q3 2023? Now, this, is, this is perfect timing. Um, just this afternoon, uh, Jerome Powell, who's the Federal Reserve Chair, uh, announced they increased interest rates by another 25 basis points, uh, which, in my opinion, uh, continues to fuel uh, the um, the uh, the noose around inflation. If it can, you know, if uh, if the if the Fed has to continue to increase interest rates for the purpose of uh, controlling inflation, uh, we continue to be in a in, not necessarily in a downward spiral, spiral, but what we can hope for this year, I believe, is um, not a recession, but what they refer to as a soft landing. And a soft landing is defined as two quarters of flat growth. And I think if we get two quarters of flat growth, I think that that's a positive. So there's not tr a, a tremendous amount to take out of today. And it wasn't, wasn't a tremendous amount to take out of what Larry just said in the previous question about LA County, but uh, in Southern California, we're, we're, we're being hit pretty hard. And uh, the I think what Mr. Powell said today is that, you know, quote unquote, he's hoping for a cut in interest rates this year. And a cut in interest rates for me, um, the way that I look at that is if they are able to do the soft landing, to me, that's a cut in interest rates, meaning that they don't raise, they don't raise rates for the next two quarters or next three quarters. And I think that would be a the, probably the most positive start to some, you know, a serious recovery in, uh, you know, again, uh, going back to Larry's indication that, uh, you know, we're, you know, we as a, we as a county is, you know, we're 55th, you know, we're, we're top, I'm sorry, we're the bottom five of, of the top 55 cities in the country. And that's, to me, you know, uh, Los Angeles is, is a great place for, for me and my firm to do business. I, I love doing business in Los Angeles and, you know, the, the point is, is that there's a lot of positives to take away from the region um, on a social and personal level. But boy, am I looking for some real positives on the business level. And um, and that positive for me is flat growth. And especially with the with the companies that we deal with in our restructuring practice, you know, flat growth would be 
would be wonderful because it would be um, a beginning, a beginning of a new era in the fact that uh, there's a chance that uh, interest rates will decrease over the next couple of years, but not in the next 12 months by any means. So. Okay. Well, great. Thank you. Um, Brian, um, how has the onerous tax regime of 13.3% impacted the use of out-of-state trusts and the migration to states like Nevada, Texas, and Florida? Sure. Thanks, Elsa. Uh, you know, a couple of guarantees in life, death and taxes. The other guarantee is that California is going to go after wealthy families and individuals. Um, the, you know, we've had one party rule. Our tax system is a mess, starting back with Prop 13, where we have artificially low property taxes, which leads to higher taxes, whether it's sales tax or income tax at 13.3%. Uh, it's crushing. And then there's other local initiatives and state initiatives, such as, uh, initiatives such as the LA uh, city mansion tax and the wealth tax and exit taxes that are being proposed by the state. Uh, you know, there are things you can do um, uh, from a planning perspective that would minimize that friction from taxes on investments. I think the first approach is if you're starting a business and you, you're already wealthy, you really need to think about the location of where you're uh, setting up that business. Uh, if you use out-of-state trust vehicles, uh, actually having ownership as part of those out-of-state uh, structures to, to minimize taxes uh, can be a huge impact. If you are uh, if you got out-of-state beneficiaries on trusts, uh, having a California trust is probably not, uh, is, it definitely is not the most tax efficient piece of it. Uh, there's other pieces uh, in terms of trust planning that provide administrative flexibility uh, that is better than the regime that we have in California. Uh, you know, the, a lot of investors are using the use of insurance wrappers and, uh, you know, other uh, credit lines to access liquidity uh, to build capital uh, or uh, access capital. Moving out of state um, is is certainly a trend that we're seeing. I was actually just on a conversation with somebody this morning that is building a 100,000 square foot facility in Las Vegas uh, for a California business that is moving out. That is definitely a trend that we are seeing. Uh, my concern from an economic impact is if you go too far for wealth creators, it's, it's going to create an adverse situation where people are gonna be looking uh, for other uh, ways to set up stuff out of state. And we see, you know, Texas and Florida being the primary ones where they are actually full-time advertising for businesses to come their direction. And we've seen many corporate uh, entities such as Toyota, you know, um, Occidental Petroleum and others uh, leave the Southern California landscape. And unfortunately that trend is gonna continue. Right, right. Um, okay, I think this leads to to Kevin. You know, what are your thoughts, and and what does the federal tax landscape look for twenty twenty three as we approach a presidential election in twenty twenty four? Sorry about that. Um, I was I was muted there for a second. Um, the it's there's there's not not a lot going to be going on in twenty three at the federal level. Uh, we have the we have the election in 2024, which and, and there's a number of provisions that sunset in 25 and 26. But as far as 2023 is concerned, you know the, the normal adjustments in the in the tax brackets and the tax rates the, the tax rates won't change. What they do is they they try to explain that they don't raise taxes, but uh, they they adjust the tax brackets by which you. Um, the uh, the tax rates apply. So in, in essence, it, it, every year there's a tax increase. But um, but as far as anything major at the federal level, um, I don't see anything at this point. I know that uh, there was uh, that every year there's a um, a corrections bill, and the corrections bill for 2022 was uh, fairly light. The number of uh, deductions at the personal level have uh, have changed and or eliminated and. I think what what has happened is there's a there was a whole slew of things that came into play as incentives from 2018 through 2021, uh, but starting in 22 and through 24, 25 or so, uh, there's other things that are going to be phased out, and by 2026, uh, there's going to be uh, what we're talking about now. You know, may not apply. We're, we're I don't think we're going to be looking at 
rates higher than 37 percent maybe 39.6 which is historically the highest number uh or the highest percentage rate for the highest taxpayers highest earned taxpayers um but as far as anything major or you know that jumps off the page at me uh, for 2023 I, I don't see anything at this point okay great thank you um, and, and Larry, given the challenges that, you know, both Brian and Kevin have just discussed, you know, how does LA compete? Is there a bright side to all of this? We're, we're looking for that silver lining, I hope. Well, I just moved here from Texas. So, uh, <laughs> you know, let me, let me introduce that as a, a, a one small anecdote. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was, um, I was dying to get to California. I don't, I don't think Texas is a, is a great place for, uh, progressive gay men such as myself today. Uh, I was flying home at Christmas and, and um, you know, my, my seatmate, who's an attorney in Nevada, was like, I'm not going to let my, my daughters go to college in Texas. So, um, you know, but, you know, we can't, <laughs> you know, you can't build a house on our progressive values here, but I think they do still have some meaning for California. And I think those are areas we can lean into uh, as we make the case for California. And there's, you know, I talked about where we were in that bottom 40th percentile from job growth, but let me let me highlight a few data points that I think the wind is at our back. Um, you know, this is one of the youngest populations uh, on the West Coast in terms of median age compared to our uh, California, Oregon, and Washington peers. Uh, we have a high labor force participation rate. Um, and so when you talk about some of these uh, other uh, lower cost commodity states, uh, you're just not gonna see that labor force participation rate. I remember uh, working in Oregon in a, a similar role and was, was surprised because a Kentucky business was talking to me because they couldn't find workers. Um, and so I think there is a tremendous availability of labor here. Uh, and finally, it continues to be a highly educated population. So, um, those are three positive fundamentals uh, I would want to highlight. Um, in addition to the progressive environment, which, you know, we're certainly covering the onerous part of that, uh, you know, but I, I think post Dobbs, um, you know, I think those are some meaningful distinctions as well, Elsa. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, the consumer products market, including specialty retail, uh, has been hit hard, especially with the changing landscape of Main Street commercial real estate. For example, smaller spaces and more mixed use properties. Kevin, what is the near term outlook for commercial real estate, including? Um, here, here specifically in Los Angeles, um, where where this question came from, and I, I wrote this question. Uh, the main the main focus was to show that. Uh, uh, and my my perch in LA is, is Santa Monica, so we we, we in Santa Monica are very uh, consumer consumer products driven. The Promenade and uh, Wilshire Boulevard and various other locations throughout Santa Monica are very heavily consumer products driven. And uh, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, in uh, some of our some of our clients who are uh, occupying a commercial space, they are. They're downsizing tremendously. They're going from 75, 100, 150,000 square feet to 30,000 square feet, or some are going to 15,000 square feet. But where the, the main focus of this was uh, smaller spaces uh, for uh, for retail and specialty retail specifically in the, in the food industry and the coffee industry, which is, I, I just read today that uh, Starbucks closed a number of stores in uh, in Los Angeles, and the reason being wasn't necessarily an economic issue, but it was a crime issue. So, uh, crime is a, is certainly a an overlying issue, which I, I really don't want to touch on because it's not my area of expertise. But I think it's a it's the elephant in the room. I mean, the continued crime that you know I you know I came to I came to Santa Monica a, a number of years ago, and I've been here for a long time. And um, my I look at I quote my city. Uh, is was in was in shambles as of you know in 2020 and everything that, that took place and i i have some horrific horrific pictures of what the consumer product the consumer was seeing in 2020 and 2021 with all the boarded up uh, stores and uh people just ran you know, even prime example starbucks at second and uh second in wilshire in santa monica just completely walked away from 
from that property. They they walked away from the lease. I I worked with them on that on that on that lease to get that lease restructured, and they 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 just basically said, Kevin, we're walking away. We we don't really care. We we're, we're tired of the crime and we're tired of of the issues that we have in Santa Monica. Um, but again, that's again that's certainly not my area of expertise. So I'm going to leave that one alone. Um, other than what I just said, but uh, smaller spaces continue to move online, um, you know, which affects employees, which affects the number of employees that that people need to em employ in their in their retail in their retail stores or their commercial stores. Um, but the uh, the near near term outlook is, in my opinion, is it's not good, at least not over the th next three to six months. Um, I think you know. How long does it take uh, interest rates from Washington to hit, you know, to hit Main Street? Main Street is, uh, you know, it's, I use the analogy, something's created in, in Los Angeles or in Southern California, and it takes five years to get back to the East Coast. And so the same way is that, you know, if policy is, uh, you know, policy is one thing, but implementing policy is another. And, um just because we may have some good public policies doesn't mean that they're being implemented. And um, so, just change again. Overall, again, overall again, change. it's just you know, it's there. I could go on and on, but uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of changes taking place, and I mm -hmm. and I would hope that in five years we look back and say they were they were painful, but they were positive changes. But um, at this point, I, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, great. Thank you for your thoughts on that. Um, uh, Brian, are the labor regulations and cost of labor impacting the movement of business out of state, businesses out of state, I would say? Uh, yes and yes. I think it's also impacting the uh, ability for new business formation. Uh, it's very difficult being a small business owner and trying to keep up with the pace of regulations uh, that you have to comply with. I'm a member of a group called Vistage, and you know, we have about 15 small to middle market businesses uh, ranging from anywhere from probably 20 employees to uh, several hundred. And the human resource issues alone, uh, you know, the independent contractor versus, you know, the W-2 employees, certainly uh, an issue with some of these businesses. Uh, just the compliance with human resources. Uh, it's very difficult to staff your own human resources department and keep keep up with things. And so that's from a regulation standpoint, the burden of the regulations that come down from the state level are tremendous, not to mention workers' comp insurance, et cetera. Um, you know, the other area in terms of the cost of labor, uh, and I know our real estate panel will probably address the affordability of housing, uh, but that's the other issue. Uh, a college grad coming out, the for them to live in a city like Los Angeles, tremendously expensive. Uh, given the apartment rents and just a car and, you know, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely in the labor market uh, in certain sectors like tech and our business it, up until recently has been very intense in terms of the competitiveness. I think tech, you're seeing a lot of layoffs, so I, I suspect that will change. But uh, I know one member of my Vistage group who's software oriented, he is looking actively to hire out of state because the cost is dramatically less. Mm -hmm. Well, to continue that thought, you know, just about small businesses, um, how has increased regulation, litigation from trial lawyers, cost of living, you, you touched on some of this, crime and traffic impacted the ability for, for them to compete in California? So, yeah, the, uh, you know, the trial lawyers, uh, you know, it gets back to what I talked about, the increase, you know, we talk about the labor side, but there's the other side of it in terms of products, that if you're not compliant, with certain things, uh, you know, the class action lawyers, the trial lawyers are are actively looking for violations. Uh, we see this also on the real estate side. I'm sure the real estate panel will uh, touch base on this well, but it is very much a consumer friendly, uh, employee friendly state environment. It's gotten out of balance, and that is a huge challenge not only on the labor side uh, in the uh, human resources side, but also just uh, depending on what product you make, uh, could be, there could be an impact there. Right, right. 
Um, so Larry, from your perspective, you know, how deep are these challenges in attracting new investment to Los Angeles? Um, are there successful models of progressive economic development? Well, sure. These are uh, very real issues. And, um, you know, I've tried to be candid and, you know, what I see is, um, you know, some of the very, very real obstacles uh, facing us here in Southern California. But, uh, you know, there are successful models of progressive economic development. Let's talk about, you know, Colorado. Um, Colorado is doing a lot of great things with international trade and infrastructure investment. And, you know, Democrat-led state with, with um, you know, I would say some more political similarities than less. The thing is, you know, we're never going, you know, we're not going to get in the commodity business. California, uh, are, you know, we don't make a pitch for business by trying to be Arkansas. You know, that's not who we are. But there are states like Colorado, like Washington State, certainly like Massachusetts, uh, where you're seeing proactive uh, governors uh, and state legislatures looking to improve their competitiveness. And, uh, you know, I want to say that, you know, I identify with what Brian is saying, that these are very real issues uh, that we've all got to think about as a community. And I'm sure some of you saw uh, the Claremont study on where are businesses from Southern California going. And, uh, you know, the top three uh, were in Nevada. You know, so uh, I think that really speaks to the depth of the regulatory issues. But in terms of our overall ranking, um, you know, housing and crime were, were issues that I feel like we as a community can affect. Um, so, you know, we have a, a high value added product uh, that's interesting to businesses from around the world. Uh, but we've got to continue to work on that competitiveness. Uh, and maybe try to emulate some of our peers in, in Colorado and Washington State. Good to. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Larry. Sure. Um, so we're down to our last question. And for, for those that are on the panel here, I just ask that we try to keep it kind of short so we can keep everybody on track for, for the next segment here. So um, what I'm going to ask here is on a scale of one to 10, one being extremely concerned and 10 being extremely optimistic, how do you feel about where the workforce is going to be in the next six months from now? Um, and uh, we'll start with you, Brian. Yeah, I'd say we're at a five and I think we're trending upward, meaning in a more favorable situation. Uh, I think Larry brought up some really interesting statistics uh, and I'll just, you know, I've been I'll call it not as positive as I normally am as a lifelong Californian. You know, there is an advantage to be in a progressive state. And that is we have a great entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, you know, I think we have an, a, a huge advantage over every other state. It's just, I, obviously, we'd like to see more balance uh, so we can have a really proactive uh, uh, culture and environment for small business development. Great. Kevin? I think I'm I'm going to call it for a six. I I originally wrote eight, but I'm I'm going to call it for a six after we talked about this today. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but my firm just hired two experienced employees in the in the fourth quarter of 2022, and with a goal of two more in the first half of 23. So, if uh, if four employees over top of 20, you know that's a that's a 20 percent increase. It's not a it's not a major number, you know, overall, but I think from from our perspective, you know, a twenty percent increase in our workforce is um, is a good number. And uh, but I, you know, I hear Brian loud and clear, you know, being proactive, state trending, you know, thinking that it's trending upwards. You know, I think that's the the beauty of California. We're all we're always looking to be positive. We're always looking for the silver lining. And um, unfortunately, the the numbers and the and the demographics are are not there right now, but uh, uh, you know, as I said earlier, you know, uh, hopefully we can look in the rearview mirror five five years from now and say, yes, it was painful, but it's better. You know, we're better now than we were then. Right. Right. Thank you. And, and Larry. I'm going to go eight. <laughs> <laughs> I like you it. Know, optimistic. What, you know, what other um, what other city in the U.S. has three tier one research universities just, you know, here in Southern California with USC, UCLA and Caltech? I mean. Uh, you know, I think our workforce is what I'm most optimistic about. So, uh, and I, you know, I just love Brian's point because it's what drew me to California is there is an openness to newcomer. There's an openness to ideas. Uh, and I'm going to stay optimistic, Elsa. Thank you. 
All right, great. Thank you. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Um, I, Tori or Josh, I'll, I'll kick this back to you. Thank you so much. All right. So my quick math shows we had an average of 6.3. So a uh, little bit op- more on the optimistic side than not, but definitely some room uh, for some significant improvement. Uh, please join me in a virtual round of applause for our first panel. Elsa, Kevin, Larry, and Brian, thank you all so much for your time and for sharing your insights with us. We're going to move right into our second panel of the afternoon, which we have appropriately titled The Real Estate Question, What's Really Happening? So please meet our panelists, Erica Fink, Capital Markets with Cushman and Wakefield, Sean Pulp, Vice Chair and Head of Office Capital Markets, U.S. Southwest at Collier's, Martin Griffiths, Partner at KPMG, Kofi Nardi, CEO of Global Red, and our moderator today, Jim Cruz, Regional President of Greater LA at Kidder Matthews. Jim, welcome back. Good to see you. Jim, you might still be on mute. Jim, I think you're still on mute. I see Jim trying here. We'll give him we'll give him another minute and then I'll hop into our first question. Oh, there he is. I think he's odd. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good. All right. Apologies, everybody. So first panel was phenomenally content rich. I know this panel will be too. Martin, I'm going to have you take the first shot at this question. And really, when you distill it down, it's going to be about the behavior of lenders. So um, where we are today with interest rates rising and recession fears pretty much at a feverish pitch. What do you think you'll see relative to workouts and foreclosures over the next 12 months? Will lenders want to come back and actually take control of properties? Um, You know, I think it depends on the type of asset. I think if you look at, you know, uh, loans coming due in the industrial multifamily, uh, even though the interest rates have gone higher, uh, look, our firm believes that we're in a mild recession uh, towards the end of the year, we'll be coming out of it. So I think those types of assets um, or classes, uh, lenders will either kick the can down the road, get additional fees. Uh, they don't really want to deal with the ownership of assets. So those are always going to be pretty good and safe. Uh, office is probably the one that's the most difficult to kind of deal with. And where it is in, La- in Los Angeles, Santa Monica, still high <coughs> occupancy rates um, and things like that. So probably not much there. Downtown is where the concern is, right? Um, we'll talk more about vacancy and et cetera, but uh, we all saw probably last week, Aon is on the market for just over $200 a square foot. Uh, that is being driven by the Mez lender to get that sold. And the owner of the building just you know, threw up their hands and said, you know, let's, let's make, you know, put it on the market. So I think in certain assets, um, the only other choice they have is the lenders is to try to put it on the market and try to sell it. But most lenders don't want to own these assets. They, they want to try to figure out another way uh, to get them and get paid off the MES and, and not really go down to the senior debt. So it's really the MES borrowers that are really driving uh, what's going to be happening here. But I think office downtown is probably the riskiest where you'll see a lot of the action. All right. Thank you. Erica, your thoughts. Is Erica here or am I still on mute? Sean, let's go to you. Uh, I, yeah, you're going to see some distress. It's already happening. We um, loans. It's going to start with loan sales first. And then you see lender driven sales. And it's a matter of, yes, the lenders don't want to take these assets back. They, don't, they can avoid it. They're not in the business of operating real estate. But um you know, it's it's going to be the sectors that have the biggest issues with fundamentals and fundamentals really drive revenue. And your industrial and multifamily have great fundamentals. Uh, office is the one that's struggling. We have the highest uh, vacancy rates historically that we've ever seen. And we've got a demand issue. We have, um, you know, we have a pending recession or downturn that's coming. Layoffs have already started. Uh, we, if you think about downtown in Los Angeles, we have the highest availability rate in the country at 30% right now. That's just came out with our fourth quarter numbers. 
And you look at our uh, unemployment rates at 4.4%. So as that goes up, you'd expect the vacancy to go up as well. But we, the issue is not so much with, uh, with what's happening with economic demand. It's more with how spaces, office space is being used and, and hybrid work. And so it's going to take some time to digest that. And in the meantime, there will be distressed sales. Office valuations are already off 30 40%, and they'll continue to slide. And so it, it's expected right now to be more, more catastrophic than even the GFC with regard to office. All right. Thank you. Kofi, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I think it is really market sector and also asset class specific, right? So a lot of these acquisitions, purchases, they were actually made with good rates, you know, at good rates uh, when the interest rates were much more favorable, which means that they experienced part of the equity run that we saw with the, you know, not last year, but the last couple of years before that. And so they'd find other ways to make those payments and sustain where they are versus having to refi into less favorable rates. And those are the businesses that would remain sustainable and also those asset classes that would remain you know, sustainable and have seen that through the economic downturn. For the lenders, it really depends on, you know, I think it's been stated here, where they fall in the capital stack. Uh, that will impact their desire to either push that refinance or push the repositioning of that debt. Um, but most of them, as was stated, they don't want to be in the business of, of owning properties. Um, so they're going to most likely wait until things start to turn around. I, I agree with what Kevin said from the previous panel that we're in a sort of a soft landing period. And you know this has exposed really other weaknesses in certain business models. And so you know we look at the overall economic downturn, we look at the you know, uh, vacancy of office space. Uh, but sometimes I think it, it's critical for the businesses and operations in certain sectors to look at other aspects of how they're doing business, where they're doing business, where they're meeting their consumers and vice versa. Uh, and it's not always just related to the real estate that they're holding on to. And so we will see some exploration of workouts. It's inevitable. Uh, certain asset classes are just going to be suffering that much. Um, but again, you know, I think we have to pay attention to some of the alternatives as we're seeing a lot of places leaving the state, you know, for more favorable business environments. All right, good. Thank you. So do we did we pick up Erica? Are you back? I think so. All right, very good. Can cool. you hear me okay, Jim? Yeah. Do you do you remember what the question is? I do. I okay. do. And I actually I want to echo, yeah, I want to echo the comments that you know, a lot of lenders really don't want to take properties back. Uh, so we've seen more workouts than foreclosures so far. Um, I, I expect that that's going to continue to be true, uh, but there will also likely be an uptick on the foreclosure side. I think, unfortunately, there are some groups who bought at the peak of the market with underwriting assumptions that seemed very reasonable at the time um, have found themselves in a situation where NOI has declined, rates have gone up, and they're just unable to recapitalize at today's basis. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, though. You never want to see someone have to give a property back. All right, good. Appreciate your input. Sean, this question is only for you. Relative to uh, property taxes and um, and what's going on with Tier 1 and Tier 2 buildings, what happens to that tax base when the values uh, are reset to such such lower pricing? Yeah, this, this, this question, I mean, it, it's I, I bring this up because we think about how you get office utilization up again and how you get a city functioning you need you need really the city, city's participation as well and uh you know that that goes around the things that the city can control with with crime and uh providing a safe community and cleanliness and things like that and so i think it, it definitely is uh takes effort from all sides but it the city city's somewhat unaware i mean it generally unaware with what the impact is if you look at just downtown los angeles uh at the 38 million square feet that is in downtown los angeles what's happening right now and you you follow some of the trades that one was uh the on center that was mentioned or or pack mutual it's a historic building but the uh the property tax base of uh, the the 38 million square feet they got it in downtown if you average per square foot value is $250 a foot. If that gets cut in half, the city's the city's portion of that assessed assessment is about 27%. So that would be equivalent of them losing $16 million of revenue that goes to the, the general fund. And so 
if, if the city can't provide services because they have less revenue because of the uh, property valuations decreasing, then is that become an issue with office utilization and it becomes a uh, circular reference almost. And so I just, I think that it's, it's something that is going to happen. Uh, and so, but we need the city to kind of participate in providing these, these environments for office employ for the workers to come back and, and feel safe and, and for, for us to have a, a clean environment for them as well. So I, we, they need to be brought into the conversation as well when we talk about office util- utilization. All right. Appreciate that. So Kofi, coming back to you, um, tough environment. We know we've heard it consistently through the first panel and now uh, we're touching on it. What are your clients? What are buyers and sellers? How are they navigating through the uncertain times here? What do you see them doing? You know, it, it always starts with it depends, right? It depends on the client. It depends on the motivations of the client. And it also, again, coming back to the market sector, depends on how that market sector is performing. We've seen a lot of people really leaning into this as an opportunity to capture office space that is trading at a much smaller price per square foot. And it's also a result of their industry experiencing unique growth in what is otherwise an economic downturn from a global perspective. So, you know, everything from, you know, even even basic industries like social media marketing, we've seen them take up office space left and right because brands are going more digital, which means that the industries that support the digital marketing need more office space to facilitate servicing those clients. Um, But it is, again, very market specific and similar to, you know, the national markets where it can be regionally specific. L.A. is large enough that it does it trades the same way. You know, some parts of the city have experienced more of the impacts of the uh, job loss and also of the homelessness where others are a little bit more insulated from that and haven't been impacted quite as much. And even as we trickle down to the residential sector, just for a hot second, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, a tale of many markets as well, where people are fleeing California, but also first time home buyers who can't afford are now looking to invest. They're investing in properties in ancillary markets where they can get rental income instead of that initial dream of home ownership being their first purchase. And I think the last thing to really keep an eye out for in this sector as it relates to businesses is you know, this new emergence of what they call autonomous zones. So I I just came back a week ago from Honduras, and there's a huge development project that they've carved out an autonomous zone with the government where it's going to be extremely business friendly, and they're going to do this around the globe. And so companies that can operate remotely or have an international headquarters will have 1% business taxes in this particular autonomous zone. So that's something that I think we're going to have to keep an eye out for. And California in general is going to have to do a better job of keeping companies here. All right. Thank you, Kofi. So Erica, coming back to you, um, what are you seeing with transaction velocity right now? Transaction activity going on just in the general real estate marketplace. Do you expect it to be better than it was last year or is it going to fall off? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm pretty optimistic about the year ahead. Uh, Transaction activity started off pretty strong in 2022, but it really fell off in the summer when rates started to hike and continued to be pretty tepid throughout the fourth quarter. Uh, We actually, we we joked during the year that everyone went on an extended summer vacation and they didn't come back until after the new year. Uh, It certainly felt that way. A lot of groups were sitting on the sidelines waiting to see what was going to happen with rates, inflation, and overall real estate fundamentals. Uh, And the decrease in activity wasn't partial to any one particular sector. We saw activity drop for industrial and multifamily product too. Um, Those have been two of the most highly sought after product types in recent years. But I think we've seen a pretty drastic turnaround at the start of this year. Uh, Some of that first quarter shift is being driven by Measure ULA. Uh, There are owners who are trying to expedite a sale process uh, to try to get something closed before ULA goes into effect. Uh, But even if you put that aside, it seems like buyer sentiment is really shifting. There's been a lot of uncertainty in the market, but groups are starting to feel more confident uh, that we're at or somewhere very close to the bottom of the cycle. So although rates are still increasing, they're expecting tapered increases going forward, uh, which is creating some renewed optimism about the coming year. So I think some good news in the leasing market is going to have a positive impact on transaction activity in 2023. 
Our, our leasing partners are reporting an uptick in tenant activity. So they're getting more tour requests and more papers being traded, which is very positive sign for the market. So I would expect that as more good news anecdotes make their way around the market, it'll have ripple effects into the sales world. All right. Thank you, Erica. So Martin, I'm going to come back to you and I want to stay on the downtown LA office topic for a moment. Um, 20% vacancy rate downtown. What are your thoughts on what can be done going forward to attract tenants or maybe even getting tenants just to come back into the buildings? But what are your thoughts on uh, tenants taking a look at downtown LA? Um, you know, look, I've been, I've been coming to downtown for 37 years. Um, first at 9-11 Wilshire now, you know, in U.S. Bank Tower and uh, now here at 550 and have seen a lot of things back in, you know, back in the early 80s where rents were at 40 net and, and the, et cetera, and everything was full, right? You couldn't build quick enough to get the tenants who were anxious to be downtown. Uh, over time, um, you know, downtown has changed, uh, even with COVID and the lack of people downtown caused a little bit of a, you know, kind of a migration of the homeless. It's, you know, it's one of those issues that we talked about a couple of years ago at one of these panels. Uh, homeless is a big issue uh, that goes into safety. Uh, do people want to be downtown in that mix? I mean, in the last month or so, we've had, you know, a, you know, a tourist that was, uh, you know, injured over at uh, over at the Target, we had someone recently, st- you know, stabbed by at you know just two blocks from here where I'm at, uh, at the train station. Safety is a concern, and so the city or the government really needs to focus on how to make downtown safer, and that's going to enable uh, landlords. It's going to enable the companies to better influence people to come downtown. Right? We all talked about. It's been talked about the hybrid. Uh, environment, you know, our company is, you know, three days a week, et cetera. But that even that's a struggle, right? They're still looking at ways to, you know, stay at home because there is a concern where they park their cars and the cost of parking at these buildings. And it's just something that's very, you know, in salaries, et cetera, the cost is increasing. So that's one thing the city really should focus on, uh, you know, um, safety. Uh, They really need to figure out incentives to try to attract companies uh, to come down here. Look, a number of years ago, the movie industry was, you know, going up to Vancouver and other places. Uh, they provided incentives for, you know, filming companies to shoot in Los Angeles. Is there some type of incentive or reduced city tax that might attract tenants or a deferral that might attract tenants to come downtown? Because we're still seeing just a lot of tenants move from one building to the other, right? The the really the rate or vacancy rate doesn't change that much or it hasn't and so that really is what i see is can the city provide incentives to attract other companies to come downtown to occupy space now one could argue at 30 per 20 to 30 percent vacancy right now do we have too much vacancy or too much space and probably the answer is yes right now and are there conversions of certain assets that can reduce the office space to though ultimately increase rent so that investors are now looking at investing in downtown Los Angeles like they used to, to make it where you want to be. Look, we spend a lot of money on the underground we have here. It's It, it covers a lot of areas. We're just not getting the people to utilize it and the owners of businesses to realize that their, their people can travel without going on the freeway. We talk about people you know coming to work or not. I mean, still to this day, it's almost an hour for me to drive where I come from, and it's almost back to where it was, but no one's really coming to the office. So someone's driving on the freeway somewhere, but we have all this great public transportation. We also have to get the word out, the benefits, right? Once again, is it safe to use? Can people get to work efficiently through it? So it's it's safety. It's providing incentives. I do think we have to reduce space, and that might just be more improved more uh, approval process to convert uh, to other uses of buildings. Maybe it's multifamily, uh, but also is trying to, you know, figure out ways to get the people or the employees to want to come downtown because it's been a fabulous downtown for at least my career of 37 years. And I just don't think we have that swagger we used to back in the day. Well, in speaking with one of the largest landlords in downtown Los Angeles, Brookfield, 
I have heard that existing tenants, as they come up for renewals, are looking to shrink their footprint, sometimes by as much as 50%. I've also heard that, that tenants that were touring and looking originally for a couple of floors have got that down almost 50%. So with everybody kind of shrinking in terms of their needs, what does that, I'm, Sean, I'm going to ask you, what does that do for a, a potential investor looking at investing in downtown LA when, when basically your audience is going the opposite way of where you want it to go? Yeah, it creates a big problem because you can't you can't really underwrite any assets, and all the way we underwrite commercial real estate is typically through a discounted cash flow analysis. And so, if you can't, if you don't have any absorption, then you have no real growth, um, and it, it creates a it, the models break, and nobody can nobody can buy. And so, the sentiment couldn't be worse right now on the investor and lender side of things. Um, but just kind of go into, I, I think downtown Los Angeles is is really, um, it, it's it's a focal point for everyone right now. Our team, I, I was in Century City, so I just moved down to d- downtown Los Angeles for, with our team, knowing that we needed to be in the city and understand the city and see really what's happening. And it is, it, it's a little bit of, it is a chicken and an egg game where you'd say safety and cleanliness are the things the city needs and you need the city to provide that. But it's, it's not necessarily the case. I was looking into some of the rail ridership numbers the other day, and and you look at ridership numbers and you compare it to the castle system's occupancy numbers. And the castle system, you know, for those that you track office occupancy or utilization, uh, really across the board, across the country, there's some states that do better than others, but we're ba- basically at 50%. And historically, we've been at 85%. So it's it's no secret that it's off. But if you look at rail ridership numbers, it's about 50% as well. In December, is 165,000 people rode Metro Rail. And then if you look at in 2018, December of 2018, it was like 365,000. So rail is about half off. Occupancy is about half off as far as utilization. So is it is it safety and cleanliness or is it just foot traffic? And we hear this over and over that office is a new retail and it is. It's the, the impacts that technology has had on retail is now being had on office. And uh, I think that, you know, if it was foot traffic that uh, retail has struggled with, it's it's utilization that office is struggling with right now. So I think as we bring people back and it, as employers call people back to the office, I think the cl- I think the city gets cleaner and I think it gets safer. And it is one of the best cities in the, in, in the, in the world, really. And I, I don't think that net part of the part of the solution might be taking product offline and converting into other things, but you also have to think that we also have the infrastructure and uh, these beautiful buildings uh, that are here that are going to be taken advantage by s- some company, and it might be a technology company or it might be you know an AI company. But if you think about Salesforce and what they did in San Francisco and the 2 million plus square feet that they created an urban campus with, or if it's uh, Amazon in Seattle, we now have an opening for a major company to come in and plant uh, plant in Los Angeles. And we have the employment base. Uh, and that was talked about in the previous plant panels. So I think that this vacancy might be a, a blessing in the end where we all of a sudden have uh we have a driver that comes into the market because it just takes one big tenant doing uh, a big deal. And there's going to be a ton of uh, demand that that stems from that. All right. Interesting. So Erica and Kofi, I want uh, you guys are both in the middle of the capital flows in this, in this marketplace. What, uh, what groups, what are groups looking for today uh, relative to transactions? What seems to be the, the popular product type that people will focus on? Erica, let's start with you. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, we're we're still seeing a lot of people out there looking for industrial and multifamily properties. Um, but we're finally starting to see people actually asking us about office buildings as well, um, which has been very different than than it was the last two years. Um, you know, people didn't really want to touch office during COVID. Um, but I think what's happening is Trades are starting to occur, right? And people are starting to have a little bit of price discovery. Um, and so that's, 
you know, that's creating a lot of buyers to wake up and say, oh, you know what, now I actually feel good about where, where pricing is. I have a little bit more clarity on where things are going. And so I'm going to get back out there. But, you know, I think there's still going to be a lot of demand for industrial multifamily. Uh, but, but I do think that the office market is going to pick up as well. All right. Thank you, Erica. Kofi, same question. All about capital flow. Where's it going? Yeah, I'm going to piggyback on that the exact same place. We're seeing the same sort of demand uh, for industrial as well um, has been the probably the highest talking point for us and multifamily. The multifamily is usually out of state where a lot of our investors are looking at it because uh, cap rates are just different and uh, more favorable, uh, to be honest. But we are seeing increased demand for industrial. Even on the development side, we work with some developers. You know, they have to forecast out two years to five years out. And, and they still are very optimistic about a return to office. You know, there's a, a lot of debate on whether people are going to come back to office or not. But the fact that there's debate means some will. And so they are not afraid of building a project that's going to come to fruition three, four years out that will have, you know, office for people to return to. All right. Excellent. Good input. So, Martin, let me come back to you and let's talk about the debt markets. Um, where do you see opportunities in this market? Or is it just such a mess because of the increase in rates? And is there just lower demand? What What's going on? And that's for you, Martin. Yeah. Sorry about that. I'm on mute. Uh, no, I think there, there are a number of companies that are looking and um, ready to pounce on opportunities. I think there is just a hesitation still with the, the bid ask, um, you know, values, et cetera, that's already been talked about a little bit. I do think there will be certain assets. Um, a lot of the uh, pension funds are hitting, are getting hit by the denominator factor and, you know, there will be some assets coming up. So I do think with the dry powder and a lot of uh, real estate funds, I do think those that have the ability to close uh, with cash and not really worry about the debt markets today, but can refinance later, uh, will be the ones looking at the opportunities where what's already been talked about, where lenders are looking for a solution to getting under a loan that, um, you know, they just don't see it being sold. You know, you know the markets are with the, the people that need debt to acquire it aren't going to be able to do it. So I think people are just waiting for those assets that can be acquired or, or go out to the market uh, that can be bought with mostly uh, equity at this point and refinancing once the debt markets uh, come back and stabilize. So uh, once, as I think it was mentioned, I do think there will be some office opportunities, um, you know, multifamily and um, industrial. Yeah, there, there are people who are looking at them. It's not going to be the biggest opportunity, the, the biggest returns. I still think offices where people are looking uh, in different markets here in Los Angeles to see what they can do. All right. So this is, I've come to the last question, but I think it's one of the most important. And I'm going to ask all of you to uh, give your opinions and your observations on it. And this has to do with Measure ULA. How will the market be impacted once it goes into effect on April 1st? And Kofi, let's start with you. Try to think there's an impact. Okay, I think I'm muted there. <laughs> Coach, start, start, over. Uh, start over. Start <laughs> over. Uh, okay, you got it. I was, I was just saying I'm going to try to keep it brief because I know we're short on time. Uh, and I was going to give, you know, a little bit of an explanation of it, but everyone can Google that. They understand the, the uh, implications of the quote-unquote mansion tax that really applies to both residential and all assets classes of commercial real estate. Hey, uh, we'll, take, gonna... Kofi, we'll, take the ref we'll take the refresher course on it. Why don't you give a brief description of it? Okay, so very quickly, it adds a 4% transfer tax to properties that are sold over $5 million and under 10 million. Over 10 million, it adds 5.5%. But really, it's in addition to the existing um, tax rate. So it's 4.56 uh, net and also 6.01 net, um, respectively. So it can be upwards of a 10x increase on property taxes for properties that are conveyed, you know, on those higher price points. Both mayoral candidates were candidates were against this proposition. They didn't see it as the best route. It was really set up to fight homelessness 
It's going to create a house LA fund that will be run by the city. Um, there are a couple of exemptions in there, like Beverly Hills is not part of it because they're incorporated. Malibu is not part of it. Um, so some of the higher end areas actually won't be contributing to it. But we're going to see a lot of people who will experience sort of the counter effects of that. Developers will be shying away from developments who are having to face these potential taxes. Um, people who have invested in properties that are you know, looking at these as legacy or generational wealth building opportunities will now lose a large part of that. So that's also contradictory to the goals of the the, the measure. Um, and we'll see people find workarounds, whether it's selling before April 1st or selling just under those numbers when your numbers are coming close to it or converting buildings to condos so they can sell individually, tenants in common, separating the land from the improvements on the site. Um, but there's going to also then be increased oversight for that. And lastly, you know, it's similar to retail in that when a product has an increased price of production, whether it's supplies or manufacturing, that increase ultimately has to be passed on to somebody. And in retail, that's the consumer. In this case, we're probably going to see it passed on to the buyers or tenants. All right, great. So, Erica, you and Sean are out there transacting on an hourly basis. What do you think the impact will be? What are you seeing and what's coming up in conversation relative to buyers yeah. and sellers? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it's already having no, no. It's already having an effect on pricing and transactions. Both. Um, I think, as I mentioned briefly earlier, there are groups who are trying to beat ULA by pushing a sale through before it goes into effect. So we're seeing a decent amount of that at the moment. Um, but it's also having a downward effect on pricing across the board. You know, buyers are using discounted cash flows to underwrite to a certain return, and now they have to factor ULA into their exit pricing assumptions, which just puts downward pressure on what they're able to pay for something today. So from that standpoint, it's a really simple math exercise. All right, good. Sean? Yeah, I think that what what most people don't realize, it's additional 5.5% that that needs to be factored in, but it's 5.5% of the entire capital stack and real estate, typically two-thirds of it is financed. And so it ends up being a total of, you know, if it's a transfer tax, it's a total of 6%. It's a total of 18% of the equity. And that's that's where it's going to really deter a lot of development interest. And then interest also in buildings that need to be repositioned. So value add investments, which is disappointing because we need continued investment in our community to improve it. And now we're deterring the people that have the skills to be able to do that because there's no there's no ability for them to make money because we're taking away their profit margin. All right, great. Thanks, Sean. Okay, Martin, take us home. Now, with, 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 this, esteemed, with, with this esteemed group of what they said, I don't have much to add, but I do think it's going to be a cooler. Uh, as is pointed out that, um, you know, it's just going to be delay transactions. And I don't, I don't think the deals that would get done a year ago are going to get done like they used to. And as was said, I think it's going to be passed on as a cost and they got to make it up trying to raise rents or get that IRR that they're looking for, especially for the real estate funds that, you know, kind of have a, you know, return they have to deliver at this 5% on the the gross value is going to be very detrimental. All right. Thank you, Martin. So Josh, you've gotten our best. We're going to toss it back to you. Yeah, what a great conversation. Erica, Sean, Martin, Kofi, Jim, I want to thank you for all of the information today. You know, we promised to provide a lot of great content in a relatively short amount of time. I think we delivered on that, gave us a lot to think about across the board. Uh, another huge thank you to the panelists and moderators from both of our panels today. I want to thank our sponsors, Colliers, KPMG, and Wilmington Trust again can't do this without your support. For those of you who would like to uh, send the content that you've seen today to somebody else within your organization or a client or somebody in the community uh, that wasn't able to attend, we do have a recorded version of this that will be up on our website within the next 40 hours so that you can take that link and certainly share it. And then lastly, I want to remind you that Monday's print and digital versions of the LA Business Journal are also uh, have highlights of this event, and you can re- check out and read our, our poll results um, on our site and in the paper as well. Thank you all so much for being a part of this. We look forward to hosting you soon for another informative discussion or at our upcoming Commercial Real Estate Awards in just over a month. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon.